I have this rare opportunity to have all these little ones in the front, so I don't think I can avoid asking them some questions first. Good morning. Anybody who considers themselves to be a kid, do you know, what, what are we doing here today? Why, what are we about to do after I get done talking? Baptize, that's right. And what is baptism about? What, what do we do when we baptize someone? Well, we have a thing here of water. Maybe it involves something, do, something with, doing something with water. Maybe pour a little water over you. Maybe some water on your head. Kind of like a bath, only not really. Why do you think we take a bath when we get baptized? We don't really take a bath, that's true. But why do we pour water over somebody when we get baptized? Don't know. That's a good answer. There it was. I heard it. To get clean? Uh-huh. What are we getting clean from? Any guesses? No, we're not getting the answers. Okay, well, maybe not. It's kind of what we do when we say, well, I want to be part of God's family. So whatever I did before, I'm going to kind of take that and set it aside, and I'm going to come into God's house. And it's kind of like, well, I'll wash my hands before I come in and sit down at the table in God's house. Right? Maybe? <laughs> I have one of the baptisans sitting here. He's got to get all the right answers so he can get baptized today. That's a good thing to remember. It's like coming into God's house and washing our hands when we come into God's house. So we're ready to eat. We're ready to sit at the table and be in God's family. Yeah. Well, maybe that's enough of that. I think we got the basic point across. I'll say just a little bit to the grown-ups and maybe cut short what I had intended to say so we can keep everybody calm and happy this morning and moving in the right direction. Uh, the psalm really struck me this morning. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. I was taught in seminary that we're supposed to murmur the psalms. You just sort of whisper them to yourself again and again through your life. As you repeat the cycle again and again, it becomes the rhythm of your soul. I never really bought it. There are a few psalms that sound like that to me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, I can repeat that to myself again and again when I'm someplace where I'm feeling unsafe. But there are a bunch of psalms that don't work like that. God has gone up with a shout and with a blast of the ram's horn. It sounds like it should be fireworks. That's not murmured. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and the voice of my distress? That's, that's about pain. We should be crying that out to God. And then today, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. We get turned into a kind of a My Little Pony fever dream of unicorns and rainbows. But it's good that we hear it today on this Sunday when we get all these references to the prophets. The, the colic tells us to listen to the prophets. Isaiah is talking about his vision in, in what he's writing. We get, we, John the Baptist appears in the gospel for the first time in Advent. So it's something about the way the prophets talk. They certainly don't murmur. They proclaim. They're so on fire for the vision that God has given them, whatever it is, that they can't keep quiet about it, even for their own comfort, even for their own safety. That certainly is true of John the Baptist. He proclaimed and proclaimed and proclaimed until the world got so mad at him that they shut him up. What was it that was such a brilliant vision that he had, that he had to talk about it? We'll answer that question in a minute, but first remind ourselves what the prophets are doing. They're not fortune tellers and they're not telling the future. You may remember in the story of Elijah and Elisha, when the end of Elijah's life is coming, the company of prophets is following Elisha around saying, do you know what's going to happen? you know what's going to happen? Trying to tell him, you know, Elisha's, Elijah's about to be taken away from you. And Elisha keeps saying, shut up, yeah, go away. Because they're not really doing prophecy. They're, they're doing a parlor trick, predicting the future. Prophecy is really about talking about the way things are right now, talking about 
what we see around us that doesn't really line up with what God intends, what's happening in the world that doesn't meet with God's vision for the way the world ought to be. The prophets hold up a mirror to all of us. Now, the question is, what should we see if we look in the mirror? When I began thinking about this week, my first answer was we should see ourselves as we really are. All of our brokenness, all of our sin, all of our suffering, all of this stuff. But then I began to think, no. Partly because I'm not sure we really can see ourselves that honestly. I think our own brokenness gets in the way of our seeing our own brokenness. And besides, I think it's too small a goal for God. I think that's not enough. It's not, it's not hard enough for God to just do that. What God desires us to see is what God intends us to be. Fully who it is God intends us to be if we were perfected as God desires. What God dreams for you and for me and for all of the universe is healing and wholeness. It's that version of ourselves and of the world that we're supposed to see in the mirror. It's that that really lights the prophets up because they have been given just a glimpse of that. And if you and I were given the same glimpse, how could we keep quiet either? Well, you may guess that's a loaded question, dear friends, because we have already been given that glimpse. In baptism, when we're anointed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever, we have been made into prophets. When week by week we encounter God in the Holy Eucharist, we are given a vision of what it means for God to be with us. And most importantly, as we go through our lives and encounter everybody else in the world who is an image of Christ for us, we have seen the face of God in every one of our interactions. And heaven help us if we fail to see that in other people because of the layers of sadness and sorrow and brokenness and woundedness that the world lays on each one of us. That is what it means to be a prophet, to see through all of that stuff, to break all that stuff away and see the image of Christ that is already present in everyone around us. Well, that's fine. We're all prophets. Now, what do we do with that? Seems like it's an awfully tall order to do what Isaiah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist did with their lives. But, dear friends, we do get a little help. It turns out they didn't go out and preach complicated lectures about theology. What they did was they went out and talked about what they saw going, around, going on around them in the world. Remember what they talk about. You're trying to cheat people when you do business with them. You're trying to find ways around observing the Sabbath so you can make a little more money. You're not honoring the stranger in your gate, the foreigner who is in your midst. Simple things like how you live your life and how you treat other people. That's what prophecy is supposed to be pointing out. And so it is that you and I are able to do the same in our world. Some of it isn't easy. There are times when the issues can seem too big or too removed from us. Other times it seems like all it would take is one word in the right ear to make it happen looking at, say, the war in Israel-Palestine at the moment. There's a relatively small number of people who, if they made the correct decisions, could cause the killing to stop in 10 minutes. On the other hand, if we look at something like the lack of affordable housing in the state of Delaware, that's a much more complicated thing. There's no one we can go to and say, fix this, and 10 minutes later, everyone will have an adequate place to live. Nonetheless, we have to go after those issues. Those are the hard ones, not the ones that we can see clearly. This is evil, and we name it as evil, and that's all we have to do. But the ones that kind of look normal to us because of all of the living we've done and all of the brokenness we carry around. I'll give you an example. After this service today, one of our state representatives will be here to talk about criminal justice and incarceration. 
I'm hoping she will come with better statistics than I can give you, but I'll throw out a couple just to give you an idea of why this is a problem. Good, reliable sources of government information from various agencies suggest that 44% of people who are in jail have an undiagnosed or untreated mental health condition. 60% of people who are in jail or prison have an untreated substance abuse disorder. Over the course of recent years, there has been a bureaucratic thing going on called decarceration, reducing the number of sentences, the length of sentences, the number of people who are in prison, and so on. This has benefited fitted everyone, but it has benefited some groups more. But even despite that, the prison population does not look ethnically and racially like the U.S. population. And perhaps shockingly of all, most shockingly of all from what I was able to find this week, 70% of those who are released from prison will be back in prison within five years. It looks to me as if we are managing people's problems with the criminal justice system because we can't think of any better way to do it. And so often, what it takes to turn things around is so simple. Whether it's well, coming out of prison, can you get an ID? Can you get a bank account? Can you get a job? Can you get a place to live? These are simple, manageable things that any one of us can understand because we all do them. And these, dear friends, are the things where we, too, can be prophetic. And for heaven's sake, if all it takes to turn someone's life around is to give them a ride to the DMV or give them the down payment for an apartment, with apologies to Philip Yancey, that sounds like pretty cheap grace to me. So, thanks be to God that we're hearing this lesson now, with two weeks ago until Christmas, when the biggest and most surprising proclamation of all about God's action in the world is renewed yet again. God, come to be with us. The God who is the God of justice, but also of mercy. The God of righteousness, but also of love. The God of second chances, third chances, 70 times 7 chances, comes once again to live among us. You have your camel hair pants ready? You have your speech ready? Because, dear friends, the time has come to go out and proclaim God is once again among us. We have an awful lot of work to do. So let it begin now and continue every day from here on for the rest of our lives. Amen.